Well, because the number one thing holding Bitcoin back is the 17,000 other crypto assets that are unregulated, that are creating noise and volatility and anxiety in the system. And, all, and so that's, that's a liability to the asset class. Standards of living for the 8 billion people in the world is one question which we could spend quite a while on. If you trace the cost of a house in Miami Beach in the year 1930, my home has increased in price 305 times in 92 years. Mm -hmm. The uh, formal Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics would suggest that in fact the dollar's lost 95% of its purchasing power over that time frame. But the truth is, you know, 305x means the dollar's lost 99.7% of its purchasing power over that time frame. Uh, the implied asset inflation rate then is about 65 to 7% a year for 100 years. Saifedean and the Bitcoin standard estimated that the U.S. currency and the European currencies pegged to it have lost about 7% of their purchasing power a year or expanded at 7% a year for the last 50 years right, since Nixon went off the gold standard. But uh, if you look at the currencies in the developing world that are weaker, like in South America and Africa, they typically are, are losing power at a double that rate, so 14%. So what does it mean? It means that uh, if you want to buy an asset and you're a working class person, uh, up until the year 2020, you would have to increase your after-tax cash flows by 7% a year in order to keep up with the rate of inflation. And uh, if you lived in other countries, you might have to increase your cash flows 14 or 15% a year to keep up with inflation. The, the formal government measures are, are CPI, but CPI is the lowest possible metric that you can calculate, and it's, it's engineered in order to not go up in price. So the real inflation rate is double or triple what the consumer inflation rate is. And the distinction of, of why life is hopeless is because the currency is collapsing in value, if you're working class, you can't buy assets. You might, be a, you might be able to buy products and services that are highly manufactured with low energy content in them, but high energy content, unique, scarce assets get progressively more expensive. And the theoretical perfect money would be an immutable ledger that's mathematically correct. That means whatever your math system is, if it's 100 million coins, a billion coins, a thousand coins, then 10 stays equal to 10. 21 stays equal to 21. So if you had a mathematically correct ledger, it was shared by everybody in the world. No one could corrupt it and change it. If it was run by a deity telepathically in real time that was non-corruptible, you'd have perfect money. In the absence of God wanting to run the monetary system, the next best idea is you create a computer software program that will run such shared immutable ledger. You make it shared and you make it immutable by letting anybody in the world run that software and having all the nodes on the network check each other and kick off the corrupt nodes in order to maintain a degree of integrity and virtue in the system. So Bitcoin is an approximation of a perfect monetary system because it is correct. It has no inflation in it. It's not corruptible because it's decentralized. I think uh, the second quarter of 2020, um, the policy response to the pandemic was to lock down most of the economy in the world. Main Street shut down. And the monetary response was to lower interest rates to zero and start pumping money into the economy through asset purchases and to loosen bank loan lending restrictions, lower the reserve ratio. And that happened everywhere in the world. So we had a massive monetary stimulus while we had a massive uh, fiscal contraction or, or what I'll call a physical contraction. And you saw something which, you know, I kind of view as perverse, which is the stock market recovered to an all time high at the time when the economy was the most dysfunctional in our lifetime. And so in the year 2020, you could, you could say, if you were a Wall Street company 
And if you did nothing for the entire year, you had the best year of your life, you were up 30%, you made a fortune. And you could have hung out for the entire year on a floaty at your house in the Hamptons, done absolutely nothing, and you're 30% richer. And if you're a Main Street company, it was, first of all, you were, you were almost regulated out of existence, so you couldn't operate, right? Every, every possible impediment to operation, to doing something, providing a product, providing a service, et cetera, was thrown in your face. But if you were a Main Street company, and if, despite all the regulations that prevent you from operating, you generated 30% more cash flow, you were the same as you were at the beginning of the year. You got no benefit. So another way to say it is you have to work 30% harder to get nothing in one part of the economy, and you didn't have to work at all to get 30% richer in the other part of the economy. And I, I saw that as being extremely unfair. What it does is it, it illustrates the, the problem with a weakening currency is you're continually uh, transferring energy from the working class to the property class. Right, and, and you're making it uh, exponentially harder for the working class uh, to rise in society or to acquire anything of value. And you're making it exponentially easier for the property class to remain entrenched in power. And that seemed to, to me to be grossly unfair. I don't really worry about any of it. I think, it'll, I think the faster that the society regulates it, the faster it'll grow. And how, how does that work? Because the number one thing holding Bitcoin back is the 17,000 other crypto assets that are unregulated, that are creating noise and volatility and anxiety in the system. And, all, and so that's, that's a liability to the asset class. And then I think the, uh, the other thing holding it back is that there's $100 trillion of capital that's afraid uh, to enter into the network because they see the 17,000 other crypto assets and they're waiting to see how the, how the regulations will evolve. And I mean, your, your sense Let me, let me give you a different yeah. example. Electricity. Okay, so I invent electricity, I bring it to your town and someone like uh, wires their house and they jury rig the wiring and then your kid comes into my house and they get shocked, electrocuted and they die. And then one week later, I turn something on and the house burns down. Mm -hmm. And then someone comes along and says, electricity is bad for the human race, we should ban it. And then someone else comes along and says, no, I think that probably we can use electricity. We probably need to have building inspectors to make sure you get a certificate of occupancy before you let people like little kids play in the house. Yeah. Right? Like, am I worried about regulation? No, I, I think it's impossible that the automobile or electricity or airplanes would be deployed broadly in society without uh, speed limits, traffic lights, mm -hmm. certificates of occupancy, elementary safety so fire fi every single building in civilization right there's a fire inspection before you move into it so will regulation help or hurt in the adoption of buildings mm -hmm. and in the adoption of fire yeah. uh, so I I think the answer is you know if you're an engineer the definition of a mechanism is the degrees of freedom just slightly more than the degrees of constraint but you have to have constraints because if I have 18 degrees of freedom, the thing flops around. It doesn't work. I need two, <laughs> one, right? I need three degrees of freedom. And so re regulations are degrees of freedom in order to create mechanisms in a civilization. And uh, right now, we probably don't have enough. And the, the fact that we don't have enough creates incredible fear and anxiety and that causes public figures and public investors to pause. I have a publicly traded company, right? And <clears throat> you can read my 10K, it's 123 pages, and we spend millions of dollars a year to remain compliant, okay? And the fact that people trust those filings means that we can raise billions of dollars of capital, and every day, hundreds of millions of dollars trades hands based upon the representation of those filings. If we eliminated all those filings, 
my company would be no better than any of a hundred million other companies and everyone would simply claim the same exact thing. The capital market would dry up. We wouldn't be able to raise money. Some, uh, we, we would be no more advantaged than a criminal that wanted to lie. In fact, we'd be disadvantaged against the criminal because a criminal would just claim that they're 10x better and bigger in every way. We would lose our capital. Our employees would quit. Our customers would depart. The criminal, they would succeed for a while, eventually get shut down, and no one would succeed. It's kind of like asking what would happen if I got rid of every traffic light in the country and I told people you could drive on either the right or the left side of the street at any speed. You think you'd go faster or get there sooner? The answer is no, you wouldn't get there sooner. You wouldn't go faster. Would you sell more cars? No, what right? Is... The economy would not work if you had uh, a lack of some normative standards in order for people to engage with each other at high velocity with large sums of energy.